We're excited about the opportunity to uh, talk through some questions that you have had and uh, get the chance to answer them. Before we get started, let's begin with prayer. You join me as we pray. Our Father, it is a great joy to know that you have not left us as orphans in the world, but you've given us your word and your spirit that deals with so many of the issues of this life, all that is necessary for life and godliness. Lord, we thank you for that. And I pray in this time together that as we discuss the questions on our minds, that you'd give us your wisdom from your word and that you would encourage us by what we learn. Thank you, Father, for this time. We pray you'd be honored in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let me first of all say thank you to you men for being here. HB, Steve, Philip, thank you for your ministries of the word to us and for your willingness to sit here and take questions. All right? So um, there, are, there are a lot of questions, and just so you know, we're not going to get to them all, but uh, let's start with one I think that, that some people had when they heard we were doing a conference like this. Why should Christians want to come to and have a conference on or think about our glorious hope? What, what is the, what's the real issue, biblically, theologically? I made a statement, I think, in uh, my sermon about um, I'm going to live in the future, so I want to know about the future. And, and uh, I think it's J.C. Ryle in one of his sermons or one of his books talks about the fact that if you're going to go somewhere, say you're going to move across the world or just here within the States, you move from California to Texas, one of the things you do is you, you know, find out about where you're going, the custom, the customs up to that particular culture, the amenities, the location. You mean like if you're moving from Orange County yeah, to Texas? To is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> exactly right. So, so you do, you investigate. If you're going somewhere, you're just not going to parachute in. And, and if the greater part of my life is going to be lived beyond this life, it's, it's, it's um, crazy, it's suicidal, it's brain dead theologically, not to have a passion for that, not to want to master the prophetic scriptures, um, to get past the, the bogeyman idea that the book of Revelation, you can't understand that it's not that profitable, you know. Um, so uh, I, I, we need to regain that blessed hope that's become a buried hope. And if, if the greater part of my life is lived beyond this life, um, and if I, do inve if I investigate where I'm going in a temporary trip to a temporary location, um, how much more should, should I be setting my affection on things above? How sh uh, like Second Peter, looking for and, and hastening that day of God uh, when there'll be a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Mm, good. Yeah, I would just add to that, and I agree with what Philip said, that some of the most uh, challenging verses on Christian living immediately follow texts on the second coming. Mm -hmm. And so, to understand and be saturated with these truths regarding the future um, has a tr profound effect, uh, number one, on our evangelism. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, we only have so much time. I mean, death is coming, Christ is returning, judgment is sure, and boast not yourself of tomorrow, for you know not what a day may bring forth. Mm. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Um, an understanding of the imminence of the return of Christ really puts fuel into the fire of evangelism. Um, it also, the text we saw last night, uh, is a purifying hope that if Christ could come at any moment, then I, I need to sit up straight and keep my teeth brushed and, and be ready for the return of, uh, of Christ. And it, it ha it's a disconnect from worldliness, uh, as you see that this whole world's going up in flames. And we need to lay up for ourselves treasure in heaven and, and not here on the earth. And, and so all of those passages, I, I think it has a great effect on our worship as it uh, is a part of us looking upward to God. Um, and in generations past, even, even the hymns, um, the climactic final verse was, was always about the return of Christ. Mm. And I, I think today believers are more interested in going to Europe than they are to heaven. 
Yeah. And, and we've lost sight uh, of that. And I think prosperity mm -hmm. uh, in our country financially um, has allowed us to be very settled into our lifestyles, mm -hmm. where in the past, I mean, people were longing for the world to come yeah. because they understood the struggles of, of, of this lifetime. And so all of those things and, and many more things mm -hmm. could be added to that, Tom. But and, and for no other reason, like why, why study it or why have a conference on it? Well, for heaven's sake, send the Bible. That's right. Uh, I mean, that's enough said right there. Yeah. If um, God thought it was important, we yeah. probably should. Yeah, yeah. So, so God, <laughs> you know, put it in the Bible. So therefore, whether we get it or not, we need to preach on it and yeah. teach it and, and have it absorbed in, into our Christian lives. I mean, God knows what we need. He set the, the menu. Uh, and this is a part of what we're to be served from the pulpit and from the lectern and in our own reading of the Bible. Mm. And Tom, if I can double dip, and one of the things that strikes me when I taught through 1 Thessalonians, uh, and that may, one, may be Paul's earliest or one of his earliest letters. Um, so in our culture, it's, it's the last thing we teach new converts is eschatology. In, in that world, it was the first thing that Paul taught them, well, among the first things, right? Yeah, I mean, he refers that, to the fact a, that he taught them that while he was among that's them. That's right. Yeah. And, and every single chapter in 1 Thessalonians ha has some reference to the second coming as an ethical imperative of, you know, sanctification, evangelism, hope for the dead, and, and, and you know, and, and it's, it's antithetical to where we're at. So why should we, the very fact that we're asking the question, why should we have a conference on heaven, tells you how far we've fallen. And, I'm sorry, go ahead. I would add just one thought to that, and there are passages of Scripture to study that directly address this subject, and I would agree with everything that's just said. But I would add that woven within the fabric of the Scriptures is a perspective that is shaped by heaven, mm. by eternity, by glory. Uh, if I saw correctly the text that Steve has next out of Philippians 1, it's not really about heaven, but everything he says there is shaped by his perspective, mm. his, perspective his conviction mm. about heaven and the weight of that passage. Yeah. You know, it's been, you know, well said, I don't know who to describe it to, but that Paul only had two days on his calendar, this day and that day. But he lived this day in light of that day. And so it is not just that this is a separated subject right. and that there are selected passages that we ought to give attention to. In a real sense, the, the, the whole writings of the New Testament, the perspective of the Christian life, I think the Titus passage shows us that, mm. where he gives very practical instructions to older men, older women, yep. and then he... he pitches all of that in light of the blessed hope, where he is talking about very practical pavement level issues. But all of the Christian life is to be lived from the perspective of that blessed hope. And yes. for that reason, it's relevant to whatever yeah. discussion we're having. Well, you said heaven's not a destination, it's an orientation. Mm. Yeah. And all Philippians 3.20, your citizenship is in heaven. Philippi was 800 miles from Rome but Roman literature, Roman life, Roman law governed Philippi, and Paul takes that and says, hey, the church is an outpost of heaven on earth. So it's a destination, but it's an orientation. Mm -hmm. You know, mom was asked, was he, you know, is he going to heaven? He says, I already live there. Because, you know, our, our, our mind is set and our affections are set there. Well, and to the, to the point that several of you guys made, the, you know, I love that picture. I know you're all readers. I love that picture that this life is merely prologue. The real story of our existence, what we were made and created for, isn't here. This is just the prologue to the real story. And so it's back to the orientation. Yeah, absolutely. So that brings up the sort of related question, and you've touched on it, but let's just address it. Why is eschatology downplayed so much in today's church? Why, why don't you hear a lot about the second coming and the rapture and the millennium and the eternal state and all those things. Why, why not? 
Well, there'd be several reasons. I mean, there could be 10 reasons. Um, it's a sermon, Steve. <laughs> 10 reasons. <laughs> you know, I think one, um, there's very little verse by verse exposition through books in the Bible. Right. And if you're just a topical preacher, you're going to gravitate to your pet doctrines and and I think you can play dodgeball with eschatology if you're not preaching verse by verse through books in the Bible. So, that, that would be one reason. Um, I, I think probably because the church has become very worldly mm -hmm. and our affections are actually here and our treasure is here, and that has an effect. It doesn't have the, the curb appeal that it did in previous um, generations. Um, I think also because of differences in interpretation and people probably confused because I look to this man, I look to this man, I look to this man, and they all have different perspectives, and so I'll just sit this one out it is probably a, another reason. Um, we live in the middle, maybe fourth, of a Reformed resurgence in our day that, as John MacArthur has said in, in class numerous times, if, if you're not Reformed, you are irrelevant to what God's doing in the world right now. That's a strong statement. Well, reform, the Reformers 500 years ago basically did not address this. And so, in this Reformed resurgence with theology proper and soteriology being the tip of the spear. Uh, and throwing Christology, um, eschatology 500 years ago really was not addressed as far as, uh, you know, really getting down to parsing verbs and, and the whole thing because they were just trying to recover the gospel. Yeah. That they're, the, all of their gunpowder was fired at recovering, <clears throat> recovering the gospel. Mm. And so, they, it just wasn't on their radar, and they thought the Pope was the Antichrist and the beast out of the sea, and Rome was the whore of Babylon. And so, it, it just kind of governed their thought, well, now with the reprints of, you know, Banner Truth and all these older um, reformers' writings and imbibing all that, it just gets left out of really the discussion. Mm. Um, so, those would be four reasons, and I'm sure Philip's got six more reasons, <laughs> uh, and HB as well. No, I think Steve said it well. Those were some of the things I was thinking through. Maybe another one would be, sadly, fatigue. You know, you had, you had kind of <clears throat> 80s, a lot of stuff on prophecy, a lot of hype, a lot of, you know, a lot connecting, of bad stuff on connecting the dots. Yeah. And a lot of guys ended up with egg on their face. So I think there's a little bit of fatigue. I think materialism is huge. Yeah. You know, you, you listen to the passages we have preached, the themes that come through. The, the hope of the second coming is it, it's, you know, the, the seventh Calvary, uh, Calvary over the hill. It's come and rescue me because, you know, um, the early church was poor. And it was, it was ostracized and it was persecuted. And that's typically at least for a large part of our history in the United States and the Western world, that hasn't been our experience. And so, you know, we've, we've built our nest for getting the trees about to be cut down. And I think we've got away from that urgency, that sense of uh, this short, ugly life is not our, you know, Joel Osteen, this is not our best life now, try as you might. Uh, at times it might feel like that if you've got material wealth and security, and it just gets you away from that, the, the hope of, um, you know, being taken out of this world, uh, the suffering behind you, you lay down your cross for the crown, um, I, I, that's part of it too. Mm. All right, well, let's, um, let's go to an issue that about heaven itself. In heaven, you talked about that this morning, kind of heaven, you used a general sort of term, but let's define the difference biblically between the term that's used for heaven and then in Revelation, the new earth. What are, what are the distinctions, similarities? How should we understand those, those relationships? Yeah, well, 
Um, I felt bad, I, I confess that to you in the back room, that I didn't develop that. I, I assumed the biblical knowledge where I purposely talked about heaven and the new earth. Um, uh, they're on a continuum, but they're not the same thing. And so I think when we talk about heaven, and, and frankly, I think the, the writer that's helped me most with this is Randy Alcorn in his book, Heaven. There's a few things uh, we can differ on, but the, the, the main thesis of Randy Alcorn's book is that um, we, we've, throughout church history, so focused on, on the present heaven uh, or the intermediate state um, that we have forgot. Ultimately, heaven is earth, renewed. Uh, the regeneration that Jesus talks about in Matthew 19, 2 Peter 3, and then Revelation 21, 22, where the, you know, the, the new Jerusalem comes down, the Lord's prayer is fulfilled, God's kingdom on earth is well being done. And, and um, so right now, if, if you and I were to die or Jesus was to come, as I see it, for the church prior to the tribulation, um, we go to um, that third heaven, right? Uh, um, the throne of God where the saints dwell, the judgment seat of Christ, the marriage supper of the Lamb, the Father's house. Um, and, and, uh, but we will return with Christ in Revelation 19, taking us to 20, the millennial kingdom, and then ultimately 21 and 22 with a new earth. And, and Randy Alcorn gets into that, that we need to embrace the corporality of the resurrection the corporality of eternal life. Eternal life ultimately is not up there in a disembodied state. It's down here in a new body uh, where, as I said in, in my session, we, we, we will um, cultivate what God has created and uh, be co-regents with Him and, and do what wasn't done because of the fall, and that is, you know, um, bring God's dominion uh, to the new earth um, as the theater for his glory. And I just find that so exciting. He, he dabbles in stuff about leisure and sports and employment, which is, you know, fascinating. Um, maybe a sanctified imag imagination in some things. But just for me, I came away from that book really excited about um, eternal life is physical. I mean, I think it was C.S. Lewis said that the Christian faith is the most material religion of all the world religions. Well, it's a resurrected body on terra firma where we pursue life um, in a perfected state, but it's, it's physical. So we need to make a distinction. There's that third heaven, that, that intermediate, that present heaven we would go to, but ultimately um, heaven is a renewed earth and I, 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 where we reign with Christ forever, and I find that exciting. Don't want to jump in on that, that, that idea of the corporality and the physicality of the future life? Yeah, the co corporality meaning what? The, the joint community together, a fellowship of the saints, and yeah, I, I still think the predominant… Well, I meant corporal in the sense the body, the corporality. Oh, okay, I got you, I got you. I'm still trying to sort through when you said egg on our face, and oh. I… <laughs> uh, <laughs> What is that? <laughs> <laughs> it's egg on your face. <laughs> it's, it's in Sam's. You should find it in Sam's. The book of Sam's. the number eight. <laughs> yeah, I just did. Yeah. Um. I, <laughs> you know, actually, when I was at TMS, I just got off the boat, so to speak. I went to the post office in U-Haul and asked them for eight stamps. <laughs> uh, the lady said, what, you're going to eat? the postage stuff? <laughs> um, uh, we were short of money, so at that time, Sunday night, we'd drive through McDonald's with the girls and get the 25 cents cheeseburger, you know, the gourmet meal. And if, if I went around the van and asked how many we needed, if it was eight, I always ordered nine. It was just a, <laughs> too much trouble. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I forgot. Corporality. I, 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 Corporality. <laughs> I forgot the question anyway. <laughs> the new earth. <laughs> the new earth. Yeah, well, we were talking in, in the back room about how in Greek philosophy, this dualism and the separation of the spirit from the body and mm -hmm. elevating yep. uh, the spirit over the body and Gnosticism, yep. et cetera. Greek thought. Yeah, Greek thought coming out of Athens and the, the, the philosophers. 
and it, it's probably had an early effect uh, on the early church just mm-hmm. sorting through all of that. But I think just the fact of the incarnation itself, that Christ right. took upon himself uh, a, a human body uh, underscores the, the unique significance of the physicality of, of the body. In Psalm 40, uh, God says, or Jesus says prophetically, uh, a, a body you have prepared for me is quoted in Hebrews. Um, and that's why the Gnostics, they, they couldn't believe in a virgin birth. They, they couldn't believe in a, in a, a crucifixion. They couldn't believe in a resurrection because of the, the body mm-hmm. and, and, or a future kingdom uh, with, here on the earth. So, uh, no, everything you're saying, Philip, is, is spot on on that. And we do need to be reminded. And you mentioned Revelation 21, even just the splendor and the majesty of, of, of the new Jerusalem. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I take it literally. And, right. and it, you know, the measurements and the jewels and that God is a God of beauty mm-hmm. and God of symmetry and, and God of uh, extraordinary splendor. And it's showcased in the physicality right. of, of even the, the new Jerusalem to come. So, I mean, there's obviously so much more we could say. Mm-hmm. You know, I think even you mentioned the incarnation. I, I don't know if you run into this, but I run into a lot of people who don't really understand that Jesus is and, and always will be fully human as well <laughs> yeah. as fully God. Yeah. That he has a human body, albeit glorified, and he still has and always will have a human soul. That he's everything we are except for sin. I, and touched, a little, I touched a little bit on that with time running out on Revelation 22. We shall see him or we shall see God. And in many ways, God has a human face. It's the face of Christ. Yeah. You know, uh, Leon Morris talks about that there's a man in glory, which is, it, which is a powerful thought. And, yeah. But I think, you know, ultimately heaven's not up there. It's down here, and we've got to get that into our system. In fact, just a little fascination, something for a teaser to think through. Ral- Alcorn gets into the fact he thinks there could be nations existing in the new heaven and the new earth, because in Revelation 22, it says there that the nations enter it and go up. So, there are, will, will people, you know, certainly united one people in Christ, but there'll be ethnicities, nations, the richness of, of different cultures could be part of, of the world to come. I, I only share that as a teaser. It's not a hell I'll die on. I'm not going to write a thesis on it. But, but what, what Alcorn gets you thinking about is, again, that that, 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 that corporality, physicality, normalcy that will be supercharged and perfected in the life to come when we get away from the idea of, you know, some kind of floating Casper uh, manifestation up, up, up there. You just dated yourself. I know. I know. <laughs> there are a lot of people in this room have no 60 idea. I'm on this A ghost, just for yeah. you younger set. All right, so um, how can I, and this is, a, this is a very serious question that's just a pastoral question that I think a lot of folks have. You know, we are part of families that um, in, off, in many cases, family members die without Christ. So how is it that we can enjoy heaven? How, is, how are we going to be able to enjoy the, the glories and the joys of heaven with the reality that people that we we know and love are suffering in hell? Serious question, but an important one, I think. Well, we will have a perfected mind of Christ. We will not be omniscient, but nevertheless, we will see reality as Christ sees reality. And for Christ, for the Father, for the Spirit, I mean, that's a part of the eternal purpose and plan of God from before the foundation of the world. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Um, and when we are in heaven, first of all, we, we are going to be so overwhelmed wow. with Christ far more than who's there and who's not there. Mm-hmm. That's right. To be with Christ is heaven. And that, that's going to be so dominant it also says he will wipe away every tear from our eye. Mm. There will be no tears. 
and all, no, all sorrow will be gone. Um, and, and God himself will be the one who is the comforter and the consoler. And that will only be at the point of entrance. And from that point on, it will be perfect peace. And, and so, I, I don't think our minds can really think on all these dimensions at, at once. Um, I think we should just know that it will be perfect and that we will think godly thoughts and we will see reality as, as God sees it. We won't see with omniscience our perfect wisdom, but nevertheless, the lens mm-hmm. will be so opened up that we will agree perfectly with everything God has done. Mm-hmm. Uh, every judgment is true. In fact, the Hallelujah Chorus is, is sung because… Mm-hmm. The, Babylon has fallen. Yeah, Babylon has fallen. The whore of Babylon has been judged, and, and there's rejoicing that rings through the corridors of, of heaven, and, and we will see um, even God's judgments as right mm-hmm. and necessary, and we will really be seeing from God's perspective in, in, in that sense. So, everything that God does is right, and, it, and it's not… And, and it's almost the presupposition, like, I love people more than God does. Mm. Uh, no, God will do what's right, and, and we will adore every decision that, that God has made. Who's in, who's out, it will all be right. Mm. Yeah, we'll, you know, we'll have a perfect understanding, I think, well, not perfect, but a mature understanding sure. of the answer to the question that Abraham asked, shall not the judge of all the earth oh, do, do right? right. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know, we'll understand that that's, that's exactly the reality. We will just say amen to what those decisions are in heaven. It's a reminder, Tom, I think uh, Steve touched on this last night. We shall, when we see him, we shall be like him. We're not going to take on his features, right? We're going to, the, the continuity of our body, we take on our own features. The likeness there is, as Steve, Steve is talking about, that alignment mm-hmm. of will and nature with nothing between and so we will submit the, to God's will, and we rejoice in God's glory, and God is glorified in wrath mm-hmm. as well as in redemption, you know. As the psalmist said, man has been made for the, the day of God's wrath, and if we're in perfect tune with Him, as hard as it is for us to imagine now, there will be that sense that God is glorified in, sadly, in damnation as much as He is yes. in redemption. It's important that we keep that balance. I also think that… Um I agree with everything. I'm I'm sitting here to be the amen corner up here. (laughs) (laughs) There is a speculation that the sisters make in John 11. If you would have been here, Mm. my brother would not have died. And the Lord responds to speculation with revelation. Mm. I am the resurrection. And so I just want to just reaffirm that the focus it's not what we don't know about heaven, mm. but what we do know. Mm. And the centerpiece of it is God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I also would say that questions like that, also if to the degree that they are sincere, should be matched with an urgency for us to be doing the Great Commission now. That's right. To the degree that that question is sincere, there is work for us to do, and the urgency of the gospel, not just to loved ones, but to the lost who will all spend eternity in punishment Mm. if the gospel is not heard and believed. You know, Tom, just to add one more thing, too, I, like Deuteronomy 29, 29, the things revealed belong to us and yep. the things that have not been revealed, yep. God hasn't turned all of his cards over. Hmm. And he's told us, in essence, what we need to know, and we don't need to know everything. And, and so Calvin said, John Calvin, I refuse to be a speculative theologian, meaning addressing issues that are actually not answered in Scripture. I mean, we really kind of get away from actually divine revelation as we're trying to piece, kind of almost duct tape certain answers together that are not directly addressed by Scripture. And Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, I refuse to believe a matter until I can put finger on chapter and verse. 
And so some of the speculative questions, Mm -hmm. um, we're just going to have to live with some mystery until God chooses one day in heaven maybe to to, to expand our understanding on these Mm. things. But God in His wisdom has not revealed everything to us. Uh, And that would be, I mean, it's been said, that would be like trying to put the Atlantic Ocean into a Dixie cup, (laughs) you know, for God to tell us everything and turn uh, all the cards over. And so we just need to be content Mm -hmm. with what He has told us and live up to, as H.B. was saying, live up to what has been told us and, and not be s- speculating on certain things. Well, and if you that, need to know, God would have told us. Yeah, no, that's right. And I think to your point, H.B., it's interesting. I, I find that Christians, even though they don't have the full answer to that question, if they're in the Scriptures, they begin to see things like, I know God is just, and I know His justice has to deal with sin, mm-hmm. and I know that you know, he's, he's not being unjust in what He's doing. So they begin, even from Revelation, Yep. to receive that comfort in the revelation yep. that we have and have not yet fully received all that, that we may someday receive. But, but I think that's a great point, that, that our comfort is only found in God's revelation of Himself and His truth. And, you know, we already have, as Paul writes so well in 1 Corinthians 2, we already have the mind of yeah. Christ to the extent that He wants us to have it in this book. Tom, and so Tom to flip it in an interesting way, I'm not sure what to do with this. I'm, it's just a thought comes to me, is, is Luke 16? And the story, not the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, because I think it's a story. It's a real person being addressed. And it's interesting that the man in hell is saying, hey, go and tell my brothers, to, 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 to HB's point, go and evangelize my brothers. And ultimately, Jesus said, they have the prophets. But the point there is, I don't know what to do it, but it's a, it's a thread worth pulling at, that the person in hell is glad you're in heaven. Seems to be something of the implication. Tell them not to come to this place of torment. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's kind of to flip it. As, as, as hard as it is for us to imagine, it's interesting Jesus tells a real story, it seems, of someone being tormented. And, and as, uh, uh, in, in their horror, it's so horrible, they're, they're, they're hoping that their friends and their family don't come there. Hmm. Kind of just to flip it from heaven to, to hell. So as you live this life, what is the, the biblical doctrine that gives you the most hope? Talking about our glorious hope, obviously we've, we're talking about heaven. Beyond heaven itself, beyond what's been revealed to us about the future, is there a doctrine that is the bedrock of your assurance, your confidence, your joy in, in life right now? You know, for me, it would have to be the sovereignty of God. And included in that is the doctrine of providence, that God has ordered all things um, in His eternal decree, and that there is a resting in that ultimately. Uh, Spurgeon called it the pillow upon which I lay my head at night, that, that, that God is in the heavens and God is in control, the throne is occupied. Mm. And, and Christ has taken the scroll from the hand of the Father and is the executor and the administrator of all the details that are in that book. And so there is a, a, a resting in that and, and, a, and a great comfort in that. And it's something we have to continue to re- remind ourselves. And, but even, you know, when Peter was walking on the water, as long as he kept his eyes on the Lord, he could walk on water. But when he began to look at the waves, that's when he sank. And so we just need to keep our eye on the Lord, eyes on the Lord. And um, to me, that's the great comfort that 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 he, that that there are no maverick molecules, as R.C. Sproul would say. And and he's got the whole world in his hand, and he's got my life in his hand, and nothing comes against me except God either sends it or allows it, mm. and, and my times are in His hands, and, and He's numbered my days, and he, he appointed the day of my birth, and He's already appointed the day of my death, um, and my days are numbered, and they're written in His book when as yet there is not one of them, 
And it's not just the number of the days, but what transpires during those days, and that he's causing all things to work together for good. And that good is in the next verse, which is to conform me into the image of, of his son. And nothing can, um, can, cause, can cause that not to come to pass. Mm. And so I, I, I just take enormous comfort in that. And I know you do as well, yeah. Tom. I mean, it, it's our bedrock. I, mean, I don't know how anybody lives life without I wouldn't get out of bed if I didn't believe in the sovereignty of God. I wouldn't leave my house if I didn't <laughs> believe in the sovereignty of God. Um, and so it, it really is the linchpin that, that holds it all together, really. That's great. Yeah. I went over earlier to HB and said, I've got a good quote for you. And I said that um, Christianity is the only religion in the world where its adherents go to the grave of its founder to make sure he's not there. And it's a great, I heard that quote from H.B. Charles at a Shepherds Conference several years ago, and it's never left me, that um, that is the doctrine that gives me the hope. That's, it's the doctrine of first importance, 1 Corinthians 5, 15, 1 to 2. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll be preaching tomorrow here in 1 Peter 3. We've been born again unto a living hope through the resurrection. My hope is based on Christ's resurrection, the defeat of death, the payment for my sin. And I long for that day based on that when we can say, O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? Um, Christ is through the cross and the resurrection um, spoiled and disarmed, principalities and powers, the, 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 you know, uh, the kingdom is coming, the war is won, uh, the victory is yet to be de declared within history. And so the doctrine of the resurrection is just, that's uh, where, where, you know, um, I find my passion and my hope, and uh, that, that is our living hope mm. because we have a living Savior. Yeah. You know, it's that old chorus, again, dating myself, I serve a living Savior, and he's in the world today. Uh, you know, and, and so the resurrection mm. is, is, you know, Paul imagines, right? There, you know, historians have imagined what would history look like if Hitler hadn't gone in to Russia, uh, you know, uh, what, would, what would have happened at, you know, um, Gettysburg if the, if the Confederates had taken the high ground and you reverse history. Well, what if Christ is not, is not raised? Then, you know, preaching's powerless. Your sin's not covered. And you as a Christian are to be pitied because here you are bearing your cross, getting double trouble for no good reason. You should be pitied of all men, but, but Christ is risen. Mm, amen. And that's, that's the doctrine um, I want to preach and die on. I would uh, agree with uh, Steve that the sovereignty of God and coupled to it the providence of God are just remarkably comforting to me. Mm. Um, I say as a pastor, I wouldn't know how to shepherd my people through the past two years. Mm. Mm. Um, without confidence in the exhaustive sovereignty of God and pointing them to a God who in all of the headlines and tragedies and crises of life has everything under control. The Lord providentially turned me to expositional preaching through a man who pastored, uh, who sealed the deal for me, I should say, a man who pastored in this city um, in Dallas E.K. Bailey, hmm. and I heard him preach, the first time I heard him preach, not long after my dad had passed, I was 16, uh, when my dad passed, and uh, my, my future was kind of sh marked unofficially. All my plans for the future included my father's presence, and I just remember as a young man hearing him preach Romans 8:28 which as a boy was my favorite. And his whole sermon 
It's a long introduction. Felt like this introduction to sermon was like 30 minutes long. (laughs) And he just kept talking about one bad thing after another in the news. And he raised the question when he finally finished, some 30 minutes later with this introduction, when he finally got to the text, he wanted one question. Is it true? In light of this, that, and the other, is it true that all things really do work together? Uh, And he talked about seeing beyond the obvious. And um, hearing Steve mention it, I could just say that in the passing of these years now, that uh, I know it's true. (laughs) And and Romans 8.28 looks a lot better from the rearview mirror of life, right? (laughs) Like like, like through the windshield, (laughs) it doesn't doesn't make sense. But when you look at Romans 8 through the rearview mirror of life, I know it's assurance for the future, but when you look at it through the rearview mirror of life, my, the day of my father's death, I would have said at a certain point, was the worst day of my life, his sudden passing. There is no way in good conscience I could say that. Because I can track the blessings of God's providence in my life from that day. Hmm. I wouldn't know God the way I know him if I had not been forced to trust him by that. Hmm. And so it's just the sovereignty of God and his providential orchestration of all things for our good and for his glory makes me happy to preach in the morning if God lets me get to the pulpit. Oh, yeah. Amen. And it'll help me rest well tonight as well. Amen. That's a, that's a great way to finish our time. Thank you, HB. Um, we're going we're gonna to pray in just a moment. In fact, I'm going to ask you, HB, if you'd close us in prayer. Just to mention to you, we're going to take a 15-minute break. We'll be back here. Next session begins at 2, and Steve is going to be opening the Word of God to us. We look forward to that, Steve. Why don't you, HB, why don't you pray for this time and for him as well as he preaches the Word to us. be my privilege. Father, I thank you for this discussion and I thank you for the wisdom of these men who have shared their biblical counsel with us on very important matters. I pray, Father, for those who come to these conversations, not as mere theoretical or theological discussions. I pray for the person whose faith is on the line and who struggles with grief and sorrow and discouragement as they try to make sense of matters of life and death and eternity. And beyond, Lord, just the answers to our questions, I pray that you would fill our hearts with hope, Mm. fill our minds with truth, fill our spirits with the joy of the Lord that would be our strength. And I do pray that coming from this time together this weekend, that the hope of glory would shape our perspective in every sphere of our lives. I pray that we would leave here all the more determined to lay up treasure in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. So where our treasure is, there will our hearts be. Would you set our hearts on where Christ is and our eyes and our minds on where Christ is seated at your right hand. I thank you for each of these men who minister to us and will minister to us over the course of this weekend. And specifically now I pray for our brother Steve Lawson as he breaks open the word again to us. Would you renew our strength? Would you focus our attention? And would you ready our hearts to hear your word, to receive it with meekness, and to live out the life of the teachings of our faith to your glory? And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.